Ladies and gentlemen, let's run Gaming Citicom video. We're going to be taking a look at MSI Z170A Gaming M5 motherboard combined with Intel's i7 6700K Skylake processor. Starting things out with the looks and board's features, we here at RGT are quite the fans of the board's aesthetics and layout. Few components are strewn across the PCB, giving the whole thing a rather clean and elegant look apart from the usual assortment of VRMs and expansion slots. Looking over the board specifications, we can see it has full M2 support, along with the new standards of USB, including 3.1 Gen 2 Type-C, 316x PCIe 3.0 slots, support for dual-channel DDR4-3600, and also support for two-way SLI and three-way crossfire. But these specs compare favourably to other boards in MSI's range, including the more expensive gaming M7 and M9. However, it does lack some of the features of the, such as the hardware buttons for overclocking, and we'll discuss this in just a second. MSI's Z170 M2 ports have also undergone a slight tweak over the X99 in that they've had a change in height, allowing for larger drives in the future. The rear I.O. ports provide a great number of connectivity options, including a single port from the various new USB types and surround sound support complete with optical. Starting out with easy mode of the system's BIOS, it allows users to check out the type of memory that they've got installed in the system, check out storage devices, fan profiles, enable or disable both Game Boost and XMP, which we'll discuss in a moment, M Flash, as well as being able to monitor hardware, for example, voltages, system temperatures and also change the boot priority so they can easily configure which device the system boots from. In a moment we'll be discussing the system setup we're using for benchmarking, but if you want more information and comparison benches, don't forget to take a look in the link in the video description where you'll find a lot more information. Moving to the advanced mode of the system's BIOS, and you'll find pretty much all of the options you could ever want, including simpler tasks such as adjusting the date and time, to disabling onboard devices such as, say, the Ethernet or sound system, give more memory to the system's IGP if you're not using a discrete GPU, and of course all of this does depend on the system configuration. I've got to say that from a personal standpoint, I have been using computers for, well, quite a long time. And I really like the layout that MSI have actually given to this BIOS. I find it really intuitive and easy to use. And quite honestly, it's one of the better BIOSes that I've ever had to uh, use on a regular basis. MSI also provide a Game Boost button in Windows, which will automatically overclock your processor depending on the type. A 6700K will have a slight overclock advantage for a 6600K. It is also worth remembering that there is a hardware dial on the gaming M7, but you can actually access most of this fun functionality within the M5's BIOS and from within Windows 2, which we'll discuss in a moment. Game Boost is great for novice overclockers, but power users are probably better served for adjusting their frequencies themselves. You do, of course, want to keep an eye on your V core and temperatures. Naturally, there is an XMP button as well, which automatically allows you to get the best performance out of your system's memory. If you're new to overclocking Skylake, you're probably going to be a little thrown off with the sheer number of options. One of the benefits of Skylake is it does give you much greater granular control over your clocking. In fact, you can raise the CPU base clock by increments of just very tiny fractions you can see on video right now. I do quite like the Board Explorer functionality which allows you to see what's actually plugged into your board, what it's running at, the clock speed, the frequencies, that type of thing. It's not particularly the most you know, important feature in the world or anything like that, but it is quite handy if you've maybe come back to your system in a couple of months time and forget what's there. Command Center provides a familiar Windows based interface to allow you to overclock your system, keep an eye on temperatures, voltages and adjust fan profiles and much more besides. Power users are probably going to be spending most of their time still in BIOS, but for those who are not looking to break world records, then upwards the average user, Command Center is certainly a handy addition. This functionality isn't something new, as software overclocking has been around for some time now, but MSI is one of the more robust ones that I've personally used, and providing your hardware supports the settings, I've not personally had any issues with a single crash. The software also sports a game boost button which allows you to automatically overclock your system based upon the process you're running. A 6700K will reach 4.4GHz, while a 6600K will hit just 4.1. 
Unfortunately, from what we understand from the versions we're running, you're going to need to reboot your system after you've pressed the button, so it's not just an instantaneous toggle. While overclocking, you'll definitely want to keep an eye on your temperatures and keep your core voltage under control. In fact, even with water cooling, it's recommended you stay around 1.45 volt range. But how much of a difference does all of this make? Well, spending around 20 seconds adjusting the settings using Command Center, we got our 6700K sample running 4.6 GHz. Though we did manage to achieve 4.8 GHz in BIOS, with overclocking the memory to 2900 MHz from 2666. One of the main features of the M5 is an Ahemic Audio, which is a sound enhancement system offering virtual surround sound on stereo equipment. Additionally, the software boasts for frequency level abilities, including a bass boost and enhances voice clarity in order for the user to be able to hear voices more clearly and differentiate sound effects. These effects work across gaming, streaming on Twitch or movies. Unfortunately, we can't record the audio due to our capture setup, which is HDMI based, but it does make quite the difference in the audio clarity that we've seen. In the written review, we've linked a few samples from MSI if you'd like to check it out, but we did, however, capture the microphone input. Okay, guys, so I switched over to a secondary microphone, which is plugged in to the uh, test system, and we are utilizing the NAMIC functionality of that with this microphone. Now, this microphone is not particularly, you know, a high-end one. It's actually a very cheap one, but that serves to give us an even better baseline. So at the moment, as you can see, with microphone uh, selected, we've got listen to your mic enabled and automatic calibration enabled. And we've also got voice level up and noise gate and noise reduction. Now each of those has a distinct impact. Now what I'm going to start doing is reciting the alphabet A, probably to E, and then I'm going to disable this. And then after that, we're going to uh, start playing around with the different um, configurations just for your information. <clears throat> so I do have a bit of a cold, so I apologize. My voice is not as clear as normal. But anyway, we're going to give this a shot. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Right, now we're going to start again with this disabled. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay, cool. So now we're going to disable automatic calibration. Um, and we're just going to start messing around with the voice leveler noise gate and noise reduction then we're going to uh, actually start playing a video in the background i've actually got one loaded up um which is one of uh, amata slash amy so her voice won't com will hopefully make a bit of co uh, a conflict with mine so we can start testing out how noise gate and all of that stuff works so anyway uh, i'm going to start adjusting the voice level up and go away auto scan right one two three four Five, six, seven. Ah, OCD. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. Hopefully that's round where it was. And then we're going to start messing around with noise reduction as well. It was about 70%. So we're just going to click that, which resets all of the settings. So now I'm going to start playing uh, Amy's back uh, video in the background. I'm gonna leave all the auto on for this, just for your, uh, just for your helpfulness. And I'm gonna disable it once the video started. I'm gonna hold my phone, which is what this is playing on, a few uh, feet away. So, well, about a foot away, actually, to be precise. Apparently, I can no longer judge distances. Anyway, that's our intro playing. Don't you know it's all spiffing? So, A, B, C, D, E. I'm gonna get closer to the mic. Fine. B, C, D. E, F, G. Okay. Right, I'm going to disable that. Pause. And then we're going to do exactly the same test with me going through the alphabet with A, B, C and all of that jazz. Um, same thing. Okay. Ready? Go. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. A, B, C, D, E. E, F, G. Now I'm going to enable it. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, I think that's a pretty good place. So while the benchmarking results play on screen, let's discuss the system we're using for these very benches. 
Obviously, we're running the Z170A gaming motherboard combined with the Intel i7-6700K. We actually tested two configurations of memory, the first being a 2 times 8 gigabyte crucial ballistics 2066 megahertz set and the other one a 4 times 4 gigabyte kingston hyper x 266 megahertz set so in other words both 16 gigabytes of ram the board handled both sets of memory perfectly and overclocked the four sticks of ddr4 just as well as it managed with the two sticks for the gpu we're running a radeon r9 290x with the latest drivers and so that brings us to the thoughts and conclusions and opinions of the board. Well, as you probably gathered by now, we're pretty big fans of it. It's stable, and at £140, it's pretty damn good value for money. There's enough settings for power users will be happy, and a great array of features, such as Nehemic, uh, that gamers, streamers, and power users are also going to be served. There is, however, a glaring problem with Skylake, and that is, of course, competition from Intel's own x99 platform, as the additional threads of the 5820K make for a very compelling counter-argument compared to not that much more cash compared to the 6700K. For gamers, though, Skylake is still probably, at least for now, the better option, because games which fully utilize the power of DirectX 12 won't happen for some time, and therefore... The higher clock speed of the Skylake platform is probably still going to be the advantage. For power users though, median coders, then X99 probably makes more sense. It is horses for courses. And then again, if you're cash starved, you could probably just get, grab a 6600K, put the extra cash towards a more powerful GPU, which is probably going to get you higher frame rates. There is no denying however that Skylake itself is insanely quick. And while your mileage certainly will vary, it lends itself very well to overclocking, providing you've got a cooler and uh, beefy enough to be able to tame it. You've got very fine, granular overclocking um, options, and this board certainly gives you a myriad of them to play with. The little touches of MSI's M5 have made us genuinely fall in love with the Skylake platform, and I'd hesitate not to recommend this board for anyone looking for an upgrade. The glowing LED onboard lighting that's great in a case, and the fault LED which displays temperatures while the system is on is also rather handy. Oh, and another cool feature, if you reset the BIOS by shorting the two pins, an LED will glow blue momentarily to let you know that you've succeeded. Also rather handy if you've been doing a lot of overclocking and you've got incompatible settings. In terms of raw performance, the board, the board performs on par with other Z170A boards in its price range. In fact, it actually punches slightly above its weight class, which is rather impressive. If you do buy the board, we do recommend, however, taking things rather slowly while tweaking, focusing on one thing at a time and going from there, rather than making a whole bunch of changes and then not really being 100% certain what you've done, which is causing instability with your overclock. Instead, focus on just one or two settings, getting the most out of your memory, or perhaps at the highest out of your base clock or what have you, and you're going to get much better results. Regarding performance against, say, a Haswell, we noticed about a 10% improvement across the various tests, but this will depend largely upon the tasks you're pushing. For example, Sony Bench version 15 on the 6700K hit 925, while the slightly overclocked 4770K we're running hit 791. Similarly, 7-Zip was about 3000 MIPS faster too, but in gaming you may find slightly different results. Well. We hope you found this review informative, and if you want more information, pictures and further benchmarks and overclocking results against other setups, feel free to check out the link in the video's description. With all of that said, if you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel, and your support means a great deal to us at uh, Red Gaming Tech. So take care of yourselves and have a great day, or indeed night.